Eric Tapley is the Chief Executive Officer of Centera. I'll let him share more about his company. Previously, Eric was the Chief Technology Officer of Fourth Wing Sensors, and before that, he held senior technical and management roles at Lockheed Martin, most recently serving as the Chief Engineer of the Unmanned Solutions Business Area with multi-state operations. Eric, excuse me, Aaron Sykes is a pilot and aviation geek with entrepreneurship and aviation degrees from the University of North Dakota. He was introduced to UAS during his time as an entrepreneurial consultant for the Center of Innovation at the United States Air Force Academy. Aaron currently leads the Minnesota Autonomous Vehicle MAV Meetup, which has about 300 members in the Twin Cities area, area focusing on UAS education, safety, and outreach. Dr. Saad Bedros is the Industrial Relations Director for Robotics, Sensors, and Advanced Manufacturing for the Min Drive Initiative at the University of Minnesota. Do you want to wave, Saad? He has over 25 years of ex research experience in signal and image analytics. I'll let him share more about the, uh, the MinDrive initiative. Joel Whippenfirth serves as Winfield's Ag Technology Applications Lead, evaluating new precision ag technologies, tracking the rapidly evolving co competitive landscape, landscape of ag technology, and developing new partnerships. He also serves as the Winfield spokesperson, positioning the company in the ag technology and precision ag marketplace. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, and, and, and thanks for lending your, your great insights and your brains to, to think about this problem and this space uh, of agriculture in general. Uh, you know, I know this is a drone discussion, but as I think about my company and where I've come from, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm. I work for Land Lakes, and I actually work for one of their subsidiaries called Winfield. And for those of you who know our Indian butter maiden, you wouldn't dare to dream of her carrying a jug of Roundup around because we would never want to see that. But at our core is buying things from farmers and helping them get a better market price for them. That's our butter business. And then evolved the ag agronomy side of it, which was selling things to farmers to help them get a better price at the farm gate there. And so as Winfield has evolved, we are the largest seed and crop protection, which crop protection would be chemicals such as Roundup and other things. Uh, we are the largest seed and crop protection distributor in the United States. Our retailers tend to be cooperative based or member owned. Uh, we serve about 800 member co-ops throughout the U.S. We'd be the second largest co-op. Our sister co-op, CHS, is just on the south side of the cities here. Okay? Uh, in that space, uh, the ag technology thing, we have a suite of tools we call R7, and we're also a distributor of ag technology. So as our partners at Monsanto have come forth with Climate Corporation, we're actually the distributor of that to our retailers. The thing that we add in that space is we're a very good agronomy company. So understanding which hybrids you might plant, knowing how a nitrogen model works in the field, and how we might stabilize and keep that nitrogen in its place and out of the Des Moines watershed would be a core space that we're in, which helps the public, helps the grower, and helps our cu customers. So thanks for having me. Hello from me too, and thank, thank you very much for coming. My name is Eric Teipel. I'm the CEO of Sentera, which is a company based in Minneapolis here. We're about uh, 20 people. Um, I have uh, kind of a long history in, in a, an area that doesn't have a really long history. I've been doing what we grudgingly have decided we'll call drones. Um, we used to call them unmanned aircraft systems, but the battle has been lost. So I, I've, <laughs> I've been doing uh, drones since about 2003, um, uh, starting with the original Predator series aircraft. So I used to work for Lockheed Martin. Uh, they had a big presence in the Twin Cities, and I worked at that operation. And uh, up until when I left, I was the chief engineer of their small unmanned aircraft um, unit. Um, it's not a very well-known fact, but hundreds and hundreds of small drones used to come out of Minnesota, out of the Lockheed Martin facility here. So um, my team and I, fortunately, um, are still very much in the drone business, and we are now working for ourselves for a small VC-backed company um, here in the Twin Cities. So 
uh, cumulatively, even though it's a fairly small company, we counted up and we have 210 cumulative years in the drone business, both from a big company and a small company perspective in a lot of different verticals from the public safety, military to agriculture and infrastructure. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion and thanks again for, for having us all. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Saad Bedros. I'm at uh, the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering, uh, and I help manage the projects or collaboration with industry on projects in robotics and sensors. So mostly we, we for the precision agriculture, we manage multiple projects uh, that we'll be talking about which span mostly about uh, the flying of the UAV and managing the data for the UAV and how to look at uh, uh, using the data for e better economical purposes. In the go in my, with my background, my background is in signal and image processing uh, for the last 20 some years, but I'm mostly interested in technology transfer. So how do we identify and seed projects uh, from uh, at the university that would be possible to transfer to companies which add value to those companies. Thank you. Hey everybody, uh, like the others here, thank you very much for coming. My name is uh, Aaron Sykes. I am one of the co-founders of a Minneapolis-based group called MAV Meetup, Minneapolis Auto or Minnesota Autonomous Vehicle Meetup. Uh, relevant experience, I uh, had an opportunity to work for the Center for Innovation at the Air Force Academy for a few years which is where I got introduced to drones, uh, what we've decided are being called drones, uh, UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems, but that's just way too big of a mouthful. So uh, got to Minneapolis, and a friend and I started building, flying, crashing, and rebuilding drones. Had a lot of fun with it, so we made a group. Um, fast forward two years, we are a nonprofit focused on s education, safety, and community outreach for the uh, community of uh, drone users in tw the Twin Cities here. I think we actually have, to my count, four MAV Meetup members in the group, and so it's kind of exciting to see uh, where the industry is right now. Our group does everything from the big people that are interested in getting their first ones if they have questions. We just started a first-person video racing circuit, and uh, it's going to be really interesting to see where drones go, both as uh, piloted platforms, or both as platforms which have active pilot input, as well as uh, fully autonomous systems in the future. Thank you so much. We'd like to give um, each panelist about five minutes just to share your area of expertise, uh, your company in drone technology or a success story. Whoever would like to start first. <laughs> Saad, I know you're ready. All right, so uh, it's really interesting, you know, the the concept of where drones have been and where they're going. So uh, running the group MAV Meetup has been an extremely rewarding experience. Uh, like I said, it started out a few years ago where it was a really relaxed group of just general enthusiasts. But uh, the last few years, last two years, and especially the last year, um, it's been extremely interesting to see a few of the, uh, the more aggressive members come out uh, and join the drone industry and especially to see what's being done in the Twin Cities here. Um, of over 317 members, we have probably 40 or 50 that are operating drones uh, commercially, as well as uh, the rest of them that are everywhere from, you know, your, your in interested high school student all the way through retirees. We have uh, doctors and we have guys that barely got out of high school. Um, it's been a really fun experience to run the group, and uh, it's been interesting to see kind of how the world has changed in their view of drones. A uh, year ago, we kind of hit the benchmark where the uh, only time that drones were ever mentioned in the news was for bad things, and the, uh, the picture behind the reporter was of a military drone, uh, not a <laughs> commercial <laughs> unmanned system. Um, we kind of got over that hump, and slowly but surely, the, uh, the so society as a large, especially for business purposes, is starting to realize the value of unmanned systems for, for business as well as for search and rescue and other applications. Um, it's been interesting to see, and I think it's going to be interesting going forward. 
you know, there's some very real challenges when it comes to integrating uh, unmanned systems, whether they be multi-rotor or fixed wing, into the national airspace system as it currently exists. Uh, the first and foremost, we have to make sure that safety is is the fundamental basis uh, that we operated under. We're over only about a mile, my, maybe a mile and a half from St. Paul downtown, and uh, not very many people that aren't aviation geeks would realize that you absolutely should not be flying a drone out here. Uh, a lot of the drone education, I think, is really where it's going to start, which is what my group focuses on. But uh, above and beyond that, uh, Moore's Law has really enabled some amazing things, and the other three guys on the panel are a lot more qualified to talk to you about those. Um, but it's been interesting to see the, the progression from viewing drones as airplanes without people to starting to view them as uh, basically extremely mobile ladders. They're, they're phenomenal, phenomenal for uh, sensory uh, payloads. And long term, I see drones being very applicable and being used a lot as a way to gather a bunch of data. Um, the second half of that clearly is uh, the, the crunching of that <laughs> exorbitant amount of data. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where drones go. Um, it's been a fun to be a small part of it with Mav Meetup, and uh, it'll, be s it'll be good, so. Thank you, Aaron. So just like what Aaron was saying is that drones are mostly about data and crunching the data. So my background is in sensors and robotics, let's say. And my interest is, so we have these drones and they're gonna be collecting data. And so what, do we, what data do we wanna collect and, how, and what do we wanna use it for? And is it economically beneficial to fly these drones and, and crunch the data uh, at the end of the day? So at the University of Minnesota, we have several projects in precision agricultures. One, uh, one of the projects is about apples and apple picking. So can, what can you do with UAVs and ground vehicles to uh, assess the number of apples and when do you want to go and start picking these apples? Other projects are on uh, for corn and looking at the nitrogen deficiency of corn and how do you get, uh, take the data on the ground or up in the air and looking at the data for the, for the corn so you can analyze and say where do you want to do the, uh, uh, the where do you want to put more nitrogen than in, or in precisely or, local, uh, or in better places than others. And other, pla uh, other projects are more on soybean and insect or aphid management, which is becoming much more of a big problem since the 2000s. So this is, again, precision agriculture is about targeting, very localizing the, the, the issue from insects to, to deficiency in water or deficiency in, in, uh, in chemicals so you'd be able to target it better so you can get it in a more economical, uh, uh, economically it will be beneficial to the farmer. And, and so right now we do have these indices that we can always get and, uh, uh, and compute from regular cameras. But from, from a research aspect is, are those enough to do a, a good job for the farmers? Uh, are, or do we need to do better analysis or look at the leaves and, uh, and the amount of uh, chlorophyll that uh, is in the leaves? And what do we do about that from a machine vision with the newer technologies or or these type of aspects. So this is where we are, what we are doing at the university. Uh, I guess I will, I will just open this by saying I, I will admit that I just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. <clears throat> and when we got into uh, commercial UAS, m my mistake really was not understanding the value that's created from some of the very basic capabilities that these unmanned aircraft can provide. And a best example comes, I think, from our agriculture vertical. So we built uh, systems last year that took about 14 and a half million photos of corn and soybeans. And that does create some interesting data management problems um, in and of themselves. But what I think we, we learned, or I learned, in that process was that there's a very basic value proposition in just being able to see pictures of corn whenever you want them. 
Um, we were in a value stream where farmers were using satellite data that maybe would be available every 30 days or every 21 days unless it was cloudy. And 21 days is a long time in the agriculture growing cycle. And we got into a, uh, a business arrangement with, with one of our partners in particular where they were going to use drones to essentially replace an entire value chain that consisted of crop consultants, agronomists, soil scientists, very, a ton of institutional knowledge um, that they were going to automate. And that's a great goal, and maybe someday it will happen, but it wasn't, it wasn't practical. And what we learned is that there's tremendous value in the basic data product, the basic imaging data product to inject and complement an existing value stream. We're not seeking to get rid of an agronomist. We're not seeking to get rid of a soil scientist. We're seeking to provide them with a better input that complements a value stream that's very, very robust, has great tools already established, but just needs better data to drive a decision-making process. And uh, I kind of, I, I learned this when we were out with, a, I guess, a customer. And the customer was really kind of irritated with, with the collective us because this whole attempt to provide uh, an integrated solution wasn't giving this customer any answers for sometimes two weeks or three weeks. And he said, you know, when you brought your little airplane out to, to show me, you guys, you flew around and then you landed and you showed me the pictures. But you don't show me the pictures anymore. You have to wait two weeks for them to come in my, you know, cloud-based, um, in my Dropbox account. And by that time, whatever was going on has already happened, and I don't care anymore because it's gotten. I've, I've already noticed it myself. So why can't you just show me the pictures? So that I think for me was the biggest lesson: is to take a step back in in all of these um, applications and just make sure that we're providing something that complements an existing value stream. We certainly um, we have a very robust. R&D component because in two years, those basic data products are going to be multispectral, hyperspectral, more sophisticated analytics, more sophisticated data analysis. But for now, in ag, the fact that a user can launch a, a system that will go and image an entire field and give them geospatial awareness of what does it look like from above, that's a big deal. It saves them a lot of money and time. And in infrastructure inspection, the fact that somebody doesn't have to strap on a climbing harness and go climb up something 500 feet in the air that got damaged in a storm and they can go take a picture and see if it's even safe to go do that is a really, really big deal, both in, in human terms and in, in terms of economic benefit. I personally would not like to do that. So um, we have tried to draw a, a good balance between delivering products that complement and are useful in the moment and then to try to pay attention to what is what's coming downstream, which of course is increased autonomy, increased robustness, increased precision, um, and increased accuracy of the data products. Um, it's a lot of fun, and we've done uh, a lot of learning. And I, th I mean, there are there are all kinds of schools of thought. There are there are people experimenting with all sorts of different architectures. Um, we're an OEM supplier of sensors to people who are processing things and and doing things in many, many different ways. But for us as a business, we really just try, we try to stay focused on the immediate needs of our customers and packaging and delivering data products in a form and in with a degree of timeliness that they expect and can fit into their own um, value streams. So in the essence of, of sharing a drone success or failure story, uh, uh, the disclosure is Land Lakes Winfield does not own or operate drones. But as a former life as a field staff person, you maybe had a drone or two. So, and it looked like a little DGI Phantom, the thing that the Chinese make. And what was so funny is for the first year, we went out and we did, we did just that. We, we took pictures of corn. And it's amazing when you show a grower a picture of their field. It's no different than if I showed you a picture of your family, who'd you look for first? Yourself. Well, when you show a grower a picture of their field, it has the same impact. But the thing that's not there yet on the high tech is what does it do for the farmer? What does it do for the customer? It still needs an interpretive person in there. It still needs a doctor in there to be able to read an MRI or a bone scan. And that's the space of, you know, will 
digital platforms and ag technology and drone technology and UAS is, will that cause dinner, disintermediation of an entire uh, event of people that just becomes autonomous? And here's what I thought was funny, was there was a day where we lost the drone. You can relate. But we got these phone calls that says, oh God, you lost the drone. And we said, yeah, we did. But what you don't know is this is the 90th time we've lost it. <laughs> it's just the first time we didn't find it. <laughs> and as, you're, as in any space, practicing, learning, the models have advanced. In just two years' time, the stitching ability to bring an ortho mosaic together or to bring multiple images together of picture, 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 stitch them all together, and now we can drive to that. Those things are advancing rapidly, and, and, and we all talk about data storage. You know, in the in the beginning era of the of computers, data storage it was almost upwards of a million dollars for a gig, one gig, which I now have on a hard drive stick in my pocket. That's like four cents today. That will continue to get cheaper. So there's this merger of we're creating data at an ever ever increasing speed. How do we process it? What does it do for the grower? And I, I think you know the space. That applies to, to agriculture, the, the, the gap, as, as we all had a, a wonderful lunch and the world is driven by food. The U.S. corn crop average was 170 bushels last year. The highest recorded yield in the U.S. was 503 bushels. That means the best single individual is getting 503 and the rest of the world in the U.S. or the rest of the U.S. is getting 170. The disparity between the average and the peak has never been greater. The disparity between what the top person got and what the average U.S. farmer is getting has never been wider. So when we talk about drones for UASs, it's really about first looking at the crop. Can I, can I see something that I can do to improve it? Second, can I build a prescription for a machine to go back through the field and apply what that needs so that we can reallocate resources to where they're needed? That could be nitrogen. It could be plant health. It could be micronutrients. It could be an insecticide all those things. And Precision Ag was built for low commodity prices. Because when US producers are up against the South Americans because our dollar's worth more and they want to produce more soybeans, we do it by becoming more efficient. And Precision Ag, UAVs, these pieces are built for lower commodity prices. Would any of the panelists like to add anything before we move on to questions? So we have uh, about 15 minutes for three to five questions. If you want to just raise your hand, you'll have to speak really loudly. Have any of you used LiDAR technology to incorporate for uh, navigation of drones? And can that be used in real time onboarding on the drones to for, for navigation and storage of navigation information? Certainly use it uh, on, the, on the military side. And it is, it is possible to correlate basically terrain maps. Um, so you kind of know where you are by looking at the terrain that's underneath the aircraft in the absence of, of GPS or some other aiding technology. There are some um, you know, in the neighborhood of one and a half to two pound uh, LiDAR systems. And that would be more compatible with the systems we build today, which are generally no more than eight or nine pounds as they fly. They're not, uh, they're not really at the precision where we can deliver economic value in, in terms of either navigation or in building elevation maps. Um, there, are, there are ways to do that with standard imagery that are just as good right now for a lot lower cost, but they are getting a lot smaller and better. The, these are a little bit higher end than the, the cheaper drones, and they're being used for pipeline surveillance in these type. Those are where you can see LiDAR and LiDAR, uh, LiDAR navigation, which is much more precise. I agree with Saad. When it comes to a lot of the commercial drones that my members are using and things like that, anything under $20,000 <laughs> basically is all GPS-based for navigation. Uh, there is a graduate student that's doing some really exciting work at U of M for using visual spectrum photography uh, to allow for navigation, um, but that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge on it. There's a question over there. Please speak loudly. This is the first um, uh, entry I've, I've ever had into the concept of drones in precision ag. And everything that the four of you said is really fascinating. And 
the, the question I have for you is in the evolution of this industry, as, <clears throat> excuse me, um, have the concepts of the confidentiality of the data or the, um, or the, I'm trying to think of the right word, but I can't, but let's say, let's say a, a firm engaged in this activity gathers data and then witnesses something in the data that is uh, a health hazard or a crime or something that, that reaches beyond the, uh, the, the original intent of the data. Is that, um, have those types of issues started to come up in your field? Or is somebody doing any thinking about those issues? So basically you're asking how close we are to 1984. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and again, I'm clearly not an attorney, uh, but uh, it is interesting, you know, Isaac Asimov has a, has a great phrase about technology being agnostic, you know, and one of the big things, particularly among my users, the, the private individuals, uh, that are going and flying their Phantom or finding their Inspire or whatever, just, crank, just cranking around in, in the park or over their homes or wherever, you know, there is a, a very legitimate uh, safety and uh, privacy concerns that go along with it, which is one of the reasons that we exist to help people, you know, understand how to properly use a system. So um, it is interesting. The data gathered from your drone, from, a, from an unmanned system, is treated like any other data. So there's very few law enforcement agencies in the country that are allowed to use them. I think North Dakota is one of the pioneers in using them as that. Um, but the prevailing understanding is that, I ha is that, that I have, at least, is that particularly from a governmental organization, those images would have to be treated exactly like any other intelligence that they would receive in the field, whether it be a guy walking past a house, and you can't do anything without search warrants, you can't do anything without stuff like that. Um, what happens when it comes to private individuals using that data is a very interesting thing as well. You know, then you get into the, the civil court end of the world. There was a study, or there was a case in Tennessee, I believe it was, about a month ago where a gentleman said that his neighbor had flown an Inspire 1 over, over his house, so he shot it out of the sky <laughs> with a shotgun. Um, and then, well, so then after that, you know, there was this huge firestorm on the internet. Was it a good idea? Was it a bad idea? Was he in the right? Was he in the wrong? Um, little did he know at the time, the, uh, the DJI Inspire 1 actually has GPS uh, tracking on it, and so the Jeep, the the um, Inspire One owner was actually able to prove that he wasn't even above the guy's property. Um, complicating matters is that the FAA, which regulates everything that's in the air, views drones, unmanned aerial systems, as aircraft. So, in the strictest letter of the law, that guy didn't shoot down his neighbor's annoying toy; he took an aircraft out of the sky, <laughs> and it's kind of. Yes, it's it's enormous, and it's it's one of the things that highlights the, uh, the complications. Yes, <laughs> the complications of the area right now. Yes, I, I can say it, um, that is a great question because it's a. It, I, I'll use agriculture as an example. The um, the yield data, knowing how well a particular field is producing, um, that can have great implications for how much rent is the landowner going to charge for next year? Um, you know, how am I doing relative to my neighbor? Those things have real economic value, and the ownership of that data is can be very cloudy. We are, we're very straightforward. Uh, the, the person who owns the land and flies the flight owns the data, and even we, we can't see it. It's theirs, and if they want to stick it on their laptop and not share it with the world, you know, we have... We have options for storing in the cloud and sharing via the cloud, but if they don't want to, it's their data, and we're very clear about that. I mean, there are there are really funny stories, I guess, about a, a storm coming through and then people f flying over and looking at their storm damage, um, and they know how much is damaged, and then they, they're going to go wait for the, uh, the adjuster to go through, 
and have the adjuster say how much they think is damaged, and then they're going to pull the pictures out if it's to their advantage to pull the pictures out. So there are, well, there are a lot of questions because there's a lot of economic value flying around, no pun intended, uh, flying around in the ether based on the knowledge contained in that data. And I, I honestly hadn't even thought about the criminal aspect of it, but that's obviously that's, uh, you know, that's another issue. And I agree uh, very much with Aaron. I assume that these data products, no matter where they're held, are subject to subpoena and examination just as they would be if they were taken from, from any other source, although I am not an attorney. I think the, the definition of data uh, needs to kind of get out there. And, and uh, do you mind, how old are you? 26. 26. <laughs> now that I know that you're 26, if you wish for me to unknow that, it's unrealistic that you'd be able to access that data point from my brain. But if it was on a server, I could delete it. Thank God I lied. Thank God I lied. OK. So as you think about the definition of data, that will come into play as well as, as what's relevant that you can delete or eliminate. And you, know, you think about privacy. Uh, as an agronomist, I was walking a field using a satellite image that had a red spot in it. And the grower said, I don't know why there's an inorganic straight line in this spot. I, did my planter miss? I have no idea. I went out there and uh, apparently they were on the early side of the adoption of medical marijuana, but five years ago somebody had put a, a field of that in there. And, and, and so what are the ramifications of knowing that from a satellite? Well, that guy shouldn't have done that. It was still against the law. Did we prosecute anything? No, we just kind of laughed it off. But I, I think one of the things that's at, that's at stake here is the idea of ownership of what's above you. You own the land that you stand on. In some cases, you own the oil that's below it. But in very few cases has precedent been set that you own what's above you in that space. And so there's a little bit of a, a, a discussion to be had there uh, on what that looks like. Because satellite imagery has been being processed since 1983. And you know the things that a drone can see at a very high resolution, the satellite's been able to see for 40, uh, 20 plus years, right? So the idea of what data is, uh, but if you think about you know, the, the, the telephone industry, AT&T, uh, you know, Bell South, all those companies were built around surveillance. And so it was very easy for the NSA to develop that because it was built into their culture. They were built as listening devices, but Apple and iPhones were built as privacy devices. So I think as we look across, you know, the technology sector here, it, it depends on what it's being built for. Yeah. If it's being built for privacy, I'm not as concerned about that. We do have time for one or two more questions. Go ahead, Joel. How close to having a true practical application is the, is the technology? How many years away are we? I know we have drones. You can put a small quadcopter up. You can fly a, a section, and you can see a picture. But how close is the technology to, to, to saying, this plant is exactly this much nitrogen deficient, uh, or some other technologies where the farmer can use it. Because I, I did a conference. I work for CHS, by the way. Um, I did a conference call with farmers, and a lot of the farmers said, "I won't pay for this because I, I, I just don't see where I'm going to get the return for this." So, how close to the are we to a tangible product that a farmer would say? I'll buy that. So Oklahoma State developed some of the first NDVI response to nitrogen scores based on what you're seeing in that image. So basically how green the crop is. But there's some anomalies out there. Using the plant as a sensor has two faults. Number one, if my hybrid is more green than your hybrid because of its genetics, Pioneer DuPont genetics tend to be greener than DeKalb genetics do. That doesn't mean that they're both as equally responsive to nitrogen. So you still have to have a ground truth agronomist that's willing to say, here's our yield potential, here's what it is. It's still about a local agronomist. Big data, ag technology, drones, the insights are always local because it's never not green for the same two reasons in Nebraska as it is in Minnesota. And the thing I'd say on that is if you see a plant that's yellow, there's already been damage done. As a, as a plant physiology, you know, background. If you can see that there's something wrong, there's damage already done. But that doesn't mean that we can't still advance that. And that's where the interception of the, the, the UAV platform can't stand on its own because you actually would need to provide a model 
on soil and moisture and what was rolled up, what was put out there, and help validate what happened at that sub variability level in the field. So it's here today. We we just you you have to get growers to say you put your nitrogen rate out there, and then put mine out there and run it side by side. It's a bake off. Yep, I, I agree with that um, completely, and I, I think that um, you know we have. We have lots and lots of these little airplanes flying around, and we do keep the front door of our office unlocked, and they don't come with pitchforks or anything. So they've they've perceived some economic value in it. But as Joel said, generally, economic value is being interpreted by somebody who's really an expert, by an agronomist, not by a, a grower. And I think the same would be said of a soil map or of an as-planted map. Those are not things that uh, a farmer is directly interpreting. There's some source of expertise. We're providing a data source that will get better in the future, but today is providing uh, something that they're willing to trade uh, dollars to, ob to obtain on the time scale and at the precision that we can obtain it today. So I, I would say it is here today as well. So mo most of the projects that I know of at the university at least they're multidisciplinary. That means there is uh, people from the College of Science and Engineering, and there's people from the College of Foods and Agriculture and Natural Resources, CFANS, which are the agronomists uh, that are, they understand the domain that, and then they can tell the, the engineers, this is the kind of te uh, technology, this is what we want from the data. So right now, everybody can get the NDVI. But is the NDVI is the right index? So what I can tell you is that depending on the, what you are planting or what you are looking at, there are different problems. And NDVI might not be the right problem. So soybean, it's the insects. And can you detect aphid in, uh, 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 properly and try to say, when do you want to start uh, y using insecticides and stuff like that? So, so people are doing visual people are looking at the ndvi and they can tell you that i can fly the airplane i can tell you exactly the locations you can take that location you can put it on the tractor and it goes and people have demonstrated that but is this the right index uh, to be used so we are still doing a lot of research and a lot of ground truthing that is needed so you can say yes these indices make sense these wavelengths are the best for the aphid detection or these type of stuff. So people can use visual information right now. People use the common indices, but you still need to kind of fine tune it and you need to fine tune it to, you know, to the, to the, to the soil that you're looking for. Mostly like the calibration or normalization. Okay, uh, this only will require a one word answer from each of the panelists. I read a great article in Forbes out of the United States is far behind the rest of the world in commercial drone use. Uh, will the FAA, or what is your feeling about the FAA, uh, positive or negative, that this will change soon? Negative. <laughs> If you look at Europe, they're way, way far ahead of us. And it's mostly about, well, I know more a lot what's going on in Europe, and they're, they're pushing a lot. Even the governments are pushing uh, the, the drones and the, the drone industry. And you see a lot of companies that are very much involved, in their, uh, and there's a lot of businesses that are making good money uh, based on what they're doing. And we're still talking about it because we can't fly. It's a big issue. Is anyone positive? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I, I get the point of your question. I'd also submit for your consideration that the FAA in the United States has the single most complex air system in the world. ICAO standards are based off of FAA standards. Um, it is true that when it comes to commercial application for UAS, there are a lot of other places that are far ahead of us. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it, it does the FAA a disservice to not understand the incredibly complex uh, environment that they have to legislate for, which I'm, <laughs> good luck, guys. <laughs> like, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but. I just want to throw some numbers. 
there's uh, I read that there's 400,000 drones are sold per month the, uh, in 2015. In the world. And, and it's a very large number in, in the US. So mostly for toys right now, but there's a lot of companies uh, are working on commercial drones. And you see that the, the big companies, they're not showing up in all of these type of applications. A lot of the military, it's a hush-hush still. People don't know much about it. Uh, and it's driven by, you know, very known companies, you know, the Chinese company and a couple of companies in here. But a lot of work in the surveillance, in the filming, and all of these types that will be coming in. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd say so. Sentara has uh, what's called a Section 333 exemption which allows us to operate for commercial purposes. So there are mechanisms which are relatively new. Um, I think I kind of echo what Aaron said, having come from uh, an aviation background or manned aviation background, we do have a pretty healthy respect for this entity that has created essentially the safest form of transport ever conceived. And they are not very aggressive and um, it's worked <laughs> for all of us. Um, and sometimes it, it takes patience, Cer certainly, um, Japan, you know, has been doing aerial spraying for 20 years over rice paddies with with drones, and they get great value out of it. And we we would be moved further along had the FAA been more aggressive. It's not in their nature, so we just have to decide to find it charming. I think. <laughs> and and so in that space, what what people have, does the FAA have on staff that have been in the space that knows what the problems are? If they knew what the problems are, if they were if they were apparent what the challenges were, they'd have the laws around it. But the technology's changed more in the time that we've had lunch here yeah. than it has in the last hundred years. So how are they to govern a space that is so rapidly evolving? I I, I don't uh, I don't have confidence in, in much government at all. Uh, but the FAA is in, in in no good position to know the unknown. I want to thank Aaron, Saad, Eric and Joel again, and thank you everyone for coming to Club East St. Paul and hope to see you next month or again. Thank you.